Welcome to the first Community Mental Health Drug and Alcohol Research Network Reflective Webinar. My name is Deb Tipper and I'm the Project Officer for the Research Network. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this meeting is hosted, the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. I'd also like value the lived experience of people recovering from either mental distress or drug and alcohol issues. The importance of the topic we'll hear about today and discrimination towards people with mental health and drug and alcohol issues cannot be underestimated. The impact of both of these things can be significant and long-lasting. It's timely that last weekend's media was reporting on the issue of stigma after a call by Headspace Chief Executive Chris Tanty to crack down on language used for TV, radio and print regulators, which stigmatises mentally ill people. I'm delighted you have all chosen to join in today. We're very lucky to have the calibre of presenters in Annie Madden and Frank Quinlan to talk about the important research <coughs> work that their organisations have undertaken. Please take the opportunity in this webinar to ask questions. There's also a short questionnaire as you leave the webinar, which I'd appreciate you completing in order to assist in our planning of future events. For your colleagues who missed the chance to participate, they'll be able to view the webinar. We'll post the link on the Mental Health Coordinating Council and the Network of Alcohol and Drug and, Drug and Other Agencies websites. We're fortunate today to have as our facilitator Dr. Catherine Mills, Senior Lecturer and National Health Medical Research Fellow at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre at the University of New South Wales. Catherine's also a member of our project reference group for the Community Mental Health Drug and Alcohol Research Network. It's with great pleasure that I now pass over to Catherine. Thank you, Deb, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to our very first uh, In addition to what Deb has said, I just wanted to outline uh, the purpose of these seminars, which is to develop participants' skills uh, to be able to read publications critically and appraise their value in terms of informing clinical practice. And we hope to do that each seminar by focusing on one or two publications on a topic of interest to both mental health and drug and alcohol. And each of these webinars will have a similar structure. So we'll start with presentations by one or two invited speakers who will provide an overview of the publications we'll be reviewing. And they will focus particularly on outlining areas that are important in the process of critically appraising the publication, so such as the purpose of the research, uh, the methods used, interpretation of the results, and implications for clinical practice. So each um, presentation will go for 15 minutes, and that will be followed by 15 minutes of discussion, and, and we very much welcome um, everyone to ask questions. Uh, but we do ask if you could please save them till the end, until that discussion time, uh, as some of your questions might be answered as we go along. Uh, so we won't answer them during any of the presentations, but we'll save them for the end. So now I'd just like to uh, introduce our first speaker today. Uh, uh, Annie Madden, who's the Executive Officer of the Australian Injecting and Illicit Drug Users League, or AVIL, which is the national peak body for state territory drug user organisations and represents issues of national importance for people who use or have used illicit drugs including drug treatment consumers. She's been working in the areas of illicit drug use, bloodborne viruses, harm reduction, alcohol and other drug treatment, and drug user representation for over 20 years. Annie was an injecting drug user for over 15 years and is currently on the methadone maintenance program. She has a degree in social sciences and currently a postgraduate degree with a focus on human rights and international law. And also in addition to that, um, although Annie probably wouldn't say it herself, uh, she was inducted into the National Drug and Alcohol Honour Roll uh, reflecting her outstanding contribution both to national and international drug policy. Um, and having views, experience and insights of drug users taken into account in the development, implementation and evaluation of drug programs. Thank you, Annie. Okay. Thank you, Catherine, um, for your kind introduction. 
Um, welcome, hello everyone who's uh, watching this presentation today. Um, I've got quite a lot to get through in 15 minutes, so I'm going to get straight into it, but first I would also like to just acknowledge the traditional owners and to uh, pay my respects to Elders past and present. Um, I'd also just like to thank the Community Mental Health uh, Drug and Alcohol Research Network uh, for inviting me to participate in this today and inviting Abel to be part of this. We're really um, very pleased to be able to participate in this first webinar um, and really support the, the aims of the program. Um, so I'm going to get straight into my presentation. Uh, we've already talked about who ABLE is in terms of being the national peak body for the peer-based drug user organisations and representing people who use or have used illicit drugs, including people in uh, drug treatment programs. So um, in that context, I'm going to be uh, talking today about um, a, a range of work under our um, ABLE National Anti-Discrimination Project. Um, and uh, in particular, though, I'm going to be talking about some market research that we did and a report, which is the title of the pre my presentation, uh, Why Wouldn't I Discriminate Against All of Them, which was actually a quote from one of the general, uh, one of the participants um, in our market research from the general community who um, felt really expressing um, no discomfort in terms of uh, discriminating against people who um, inject drugs. Nevertheless, um, I'll, I'll cover back on those issues as I work through. So an overview of my presentation is that I'm going to look at our um, national anti-discrimination project and quickly look at some of the time frames and funding um, and the evidence base um, behind that. I'll also um, look at the purpose and goal of the project, um, in particular uh, the goals and objectives and the target groups. I will also be looking at the research phase of the project, which will be the major part of the presentation. First of all, looking at our independent market research that I've already referred to, and then looking at the ABLE report on stigma and discrimination, which is the why wouldn't I discriminate against all of them report. And then finally, looking very quickly at the project phase, which is just going to take you through quickly the work we're currently undertaking, I guess, on the back of that research phase to sort of implement uh, some of the findings and issues we uncovered there. So I'll work through those three major projects. Okay, so the overview of the, the anti-discrimination project. Uh, basically our work on this commenced in 2009-10 and it continues into our new two-year program that we've just been funded uh, for. We've just signed contracts for, so that'll go over 2012-14. Uh, um, now, it, interestingly, uh, I know we're sort of talking in the drug and alcohol setting today, but our funding for this project is actually provided by the Bloodborne Viruses and STI section of the Department of Health and Ageing. And part of the reason for that is because uh, that's where uh, the majority of ABLE funding comes from. In fact, we're not actually funded to do any work in the drug and alcohol area specifically. And um, I guess what the research and the available evidence shows us, however, is that um, hepatitis C related discrimination or what is often referred to as hep C related discrimination is really inextricably linked to injecting drug use into the fact that you can really not separate them and so often what is uh, pe people with hepatitis C when they experience stigma and discrimination it is almost always either about actual history of drug use or presumed uh, drug use uh, associated with their blood on virus status. So um, we basically were able to successfully convince Doha that in order before we could ever look at addressing stigma and discrimination towards people with hepatitis C and all of the implications of that, we really needed to address the fundamental issue of stigma and discrimination against people who inject drugs, um, particularly, and the evidence shows this, in the health system, the media, and in the employment or workplace environment. The purpose and goals of the uh, anti-discrimination project is to dispel misconceptions about people who inject drugs, to reduce stigma and discrimination towards people who inject drugs, and to remove barriers and improve access to health services for people who inject drugs. So you can see in that context, um, it obviously has much broader implications than simply focusing on hepatitis C or bubble viruses, although uh, that's clearly one of our major aims. The target groups uh, for our work under, under the project uh, are largely four groups, the, the general public or general community, the media, 
um, healthcare professionals in the health system and then people who inject drugs themselves. Okay, so I'm just now going to sort of talk about the research phase of the project and in this case firstly I'm going to talk about our market research. Um, so in around November 2009, for a few months there to uh, Feb 2010, we engaged an independent market research agency and we wanted them to assess the feasibility of ABLE doing a national campaign targeting the general public um, addressing stigma and discrimination towards people who inject drugs. And, you know, normally I guess you might just sort of um, not necessarily feel you need to do this kind of research beforehand, but we strongly felt that this is such a taboo issue, there's so much emotion and politics around it, it's very sensitive, and we really felt we needed to have a very good understanding of what people really think before we could look towards any sort of national campaign. So um, as it says there, we wanted to understand or better understand the perceptions of the general public and the health and healthcare professionals towards people who inject drugs and how they might respond to a campaign that might be challenging some of their misconceptions and prejudices. Um, we wanted the independence of a market research agency um, for two very specific reasons. One was that we really wanted honest answers. So we were concerned that if we undertook some market research ourselves or research ourselves into perceptions and attitudes, that actually we may not get an honest answer and they might just tell us what they think we want to hear or what they think they should say because we're in the room. And I will return to that issue later. Um, and also we wanted credibility for the, both the market research and the work that followed. So, you know, we obviously have a vested interest as people who represent drug users, so we wanted the arm's length um, viewpoint, I guess, if you like. Um, the focus groups in terms of methodology were made up of uh, members of the general public from a very broad age range, young people through to older people, diverse socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds, parents, males and females, different um, uh, backgrounds in terms of employment and unemployment. Um, we were actually advised by the market research company to select for a more progressive people in terms of their attitudes towards people inject drugs, which in itself I know sounds unusual, but I mean it just goes to the problems in this area because the, even the market research company was very concerned that actually if we just selected really totally randomly that the attitudes could be so full on that we just may not get any, anything productive from it, which is really quite scary. Um, and then we also did some focus groups, or they did with healthcare professionals, and they included GPs, emergency nurses, and pharmacists. Okay, so then um, the key findings from the, uh, the general public was that the views, we expected very strong views and very negative views, but we have to say that really even we were shocked by the strength of the views held and how consistently they were held. Um, the young people in the sample tended to be a little more tolerant of drug use, particularly if they had some personal experience of illicit drug use, not injecting drug use um, per se, but more um, you know, occasional illicit drug use. Um, they had more of a belief that it was about personal choice as long as it didn't affect other people, and that was quite critical. And for really all of the people in the general public group, there was a very clear line between what they saw as, as acceptable and non-acceptable drug use. So social drug use was acceptable, uh, such as dropping a knee or something occasionally um, on a weekend or whatever, but once you started using alone and or injecting drugs, then it very quickly became unacceptable and people are seen as being irrational and having uh, no control, no rationality, no control over their decision making. Um, injecting is also seen as crossing a line, so you've crossed this line and therefore there's no sympathy for you, um, you deserve everything that you get, you've made your bed, so to speak or your choice and you, you need to live with it. Uh, that came out very strongly, as did the stereotypes about who people who inject drugs are. So it was a very classic criminal, dirty, smelly, threatening, selfish, you know, a loser, dishonest and untrustworthy. Those were the sorts of words that people routinely used in the general public group to describe what they saw as people who inject drugs. Um, there was most gen definitely a 
fear of people who inject drugs. Um, people talked about avoiding areas where they thought drug users might be, um, and they were afraid that they're, once again, irrational, um, uh, out of control, that, that they will harm them, that they'll do something bad to them, um, physically harm them or emotionally harm them. And um, But it was really interesting, despite all of these very strong and very clear views on who drug users are and, and you know, exactly what they look like and, and, you know, the kind of people they are, actually they all admitted that they didn't actually know any people. They, didn't th they don't think they know anyone who is a drug user. And what that's speaking to, I guess, is people are basing it on the very visible minority of, um, of drug users who maybe um, are in public places and doing it really tough. And so when they come across injecting drug users who may not fit that stereotype, they don't actually recognise them at all or see them as potentially as drug users. Um, one of the more interesting things as well is the general public reacted uh, some of the sample very negatively and even aggressively when there were exercises using images that were seeking to challenge or question accepted stereotypes. Um, and, and that really sent us a very clear message about just how careful we were going to need to be if we wanted to run any campaigns that might challenge stereotypes about injectors because we could very quickly um, risk having a backlash or a negative response to any attempts to address or challenge stereotypes. Um, their information and reference points about who drug users are and what they do and the lives they live clearly can very strongly from the media and from government policy, uh, from the terms they were using. There was a real fear of contagion, fear of you know being infected with AIDS, so to speak. Um, media reports on discarded public, uh, publicly discarded injecting equipment featured strongly, as did the language, you know, the war on drugs type language, um, and that that language in itself uh, engendered a sense of fear in people who inject drugs as the enemy. Um, there's a very strong lack of empathy for anyone who injects drugs. Um, basically. Uh, there was a strong feeling that stigmatising and discriminating towards people who inject drugs is actually a good thing to do, that you're making a positive contribution to the community if you do that, because it will act as a deterrent. People won't take it up. People won't do it. Um, and that's despite the fact that we have a lot of evidence to say that isn't going to be the outcome of such behaviour, but uh, nevertheless people think that's the case. And um, there was some very slight empathy for people who were seen to be doing something to help fix or change themselves, such as someone in drug treatment, but others still saw that as, no, that's not okay, they're just people trying to get free drugs. So overall, there was a very strong lack of compassion. In terms of the health professionals, some of them were more tolerant and understanding if they had some experience with uh, drug users as patients or clients. Interestingly, in this group, Opposite to the uh, general public, the young health professionals tended to be less tolerant in their opinion of people who inject drugs. Um, they basically supported discriminating against drug users for the same reasons as the general public did, but they didn't identify um, treating a patient or client differently as discrimination. Um, like the general public, they were very comfortable in admitting that they discriminate against people who inject drugs if they knew they were injecting. And that's very unusual because often in other areas of stigma and discrimination, people are often reluctant to, to admit it publicly. This group, both of these groups weren't. And they didn't want to be associated with drug users. They didn't want their practice, general practice or their pharmacy associated with drug users. It would put other patients or clients off. And um, that you, they, they were aware that some of the older health professionals were aware that sort of this could be seen as them jeopardising their duty of care, but they thought such discrimination was justifiable because it just matched community attitudes. They weren't doing anything different than the community. Grabbing an Ian? Oh, yeah. Excuse me? Oh. Oh, okay, so um, now just very quickly on the report. So we did this report following the market research because after the market research we felt that told us quite a lot of things, but um, we really felt it didn't go far enough. It told us what is going on, but it really didn't go far enough to tell us what is, you know, actually how we managed to get to here, I guess, you know, that we're in this situation that, um, you know, Drug users are literally social pariahs um, and that our lives are seen as having no value. Um, people even express in, um, the desire, you know, to, to see people dead. It's a very, a really strong sense of dislike.
dislike and hatred for drug users. So we wanted to know how have we managed to get here historically and how do we start to change this? So in this report, we, um, felt, you know, as I said, felt we needed to look back before we could look forward. Um, it's very difficult in a um, phenomenon like this to single out one single action or definitive point in time where you can say that's where our attitudes to people who use either illicit drugs or inject started changing or developing. But we did find a range of like key historical determinants, if you like, points or key factors that did lend to what has become over time, and I'm talking over many hundreds of years, quite literally, attitudes have slowly developed. And they were, we had to go back as far as like the industrial revolution and the growth of cities and things like urban planning and when you start seeing the proliferation of factories and OH&S and profitability <coughs> and where employers you know, started to need to care about whether their workers were inebriated or not. Factors that wouldn't have mattered so much when people were just perhaps back on their farm or on their land. And so that then, you know, starts mingling with the keeping of statistics and the process of othering that we've, I've mentioned here, where you start distinguishing one kind of group from another. Morals start coming into that about who's good and who's bad and what behaviour is morally good and bad, which then links in with the growth of organised religion and things like the growth of the Protestant work ethic and the temperance movement that very much ramped up the moral... This conference system. is now in presentation mode. Um, and then also looking at uh, the impact of immigration increasing, cultural diversity, habits and practices coming into countries that perhaps hadn't been there before, um, the rise of the medical profession and uh, the pathologisation, if you like, of drug use as a disease. And of course, as we get later into the um, more recent times, we start to see a proliferation of new policy and legislation following the Vietnam War. And of course, the, the utterance of uh, Richard Nixon in terms of the language of the war on drugs, which uh, utterly changed the world forever for all of us. And, and we've really seen since that time in the 60s a continuation and growth in these very negative attitudes towards people who inject drugs. Um, basically, uh, we also in the report, um, and I'll just quickly summarise it here for you, but we do look at also a review of contemporary narratives relating to people who inject drugs and attitudes towards them. So looking at uh, concepts such as the impact of illegality and the just, that as a justification for stigma and discrimination, the fear of contagion issue, um, the whole uh, use of, I guess, of needles and syringes being seen symbolically as weapons, as things people could be attacked with and that, is, that are dangerous, and also the impact of the media or mass communication on social attitudes. Um, we also have a bit of a review in the report about contemporary social theory relating to both people who inject drugs and attitudes towards them. So we look at concepts such as criminalisation and what's called um, structural violence. We look at the uh, issue of social, legal, economic and cultural determinants of health, uh, social and cultural violence, and the whole issue of labelling people, um, the, the concept of social capital, and how users um, tend to take on strategies, I guess, to pass in society, to get by without people knowing that they're drug users. And so we look at all of these sort of, a lot of work that has been done in this area in social theory terms to look at um, how attitudes we might have today towards people who inject drugs, how they can be explained and understood. Um, finally, um, what I'll just quickly have a look at is the report also looks at some of the, what we've called the key sites of stigma and discrimination towards people who inject drugs. And they are, I guess, the general community, the media, the health system, and what we've termed self-stigma. And that is, I guess, the sort of internalised stigma that drug users take on themselves and, and sort of contribute to the continuation of negative attitudes. I very quickly wanted to show you two quotes that in looking at some of those sites, so this is one from the site of stigma and discrimination, if you like to call the media, in the media. And this is an article from a local newspaper called Addicts in the Family's Backyard. And it just says, an Ipswich mother says she fears her young children will one day be infected by one of the many dirty drug, 
dirty drug needles dumped in the backyard of her family home. She says she wanted to raise the issue so other residents and nearby households would be aware. Every morning I have to come down and check the yard before my kids get out so they don't step on a needle. It's disgusting. And the police chime in with, we need to be tougher on these morons. Now, the media is littered, absolutely littered daily with these sorts of stories. And it has to be said that while nobody, including Abel, would ever want a child or anyone to be trotting on a, on a used needle anywhere, the fact is the evidence shows that publicly discarded needles and syringes are actually a really quite a rare thing. And it, it is just they do not occur to this degree. So it's just this whole article is really built on fears, stereotypes, and, and keeping those, those fears and stereotypes going, if you like. And then finally, um, I, I wanted to sort of look at this one because I wanted to sort of show just how far stigma and discrimination can go in the health system and that it's not a minor issue and that it does literally result in death. And unfortunately, this very shocking case that I do is not um, an isolated one. We do hear of these cases reasonably regularly. So it's titled, Doctor Rejected Dying Man as Addict. A gravely ill man, wrongly assumed to be an addict, craving strong drugs, died in agony hours after being discharged from a New South Wales country hospital a coroner had found. He was refused pain relief for his excruciating condition. The hospital had failed to diagnose the man's life-threatening condition, failed to give him adequate pain relief, and discharged him, although he was very clearly very ill. He had clung to his hospital bed, begging not to be sent home. He had told others the staff thought he was a junkie who had been wanting drugs like an addict. The doctor had made gro a gross error of judgment after forming a fixed view that his underlying problem was substance abuse. The doctor had refused pain relief except for a couple of tablets of paracetamol. The doctor admitted making critical errors, including without proper reasonable basis, prematurely concluding the man was drug seeking. Nurses seemed to have been more sensitive to his condition, but were rebuffed by the doctor, told the nurse, what is he still doing in my department? So this is now currently going through um, legal proceedings. It's a real case. And as I say, unfortunately, it is not an isolated one. And it does go to the fact that stigma can kill, particularly in the health system. Um, finally, a good news story um, before I just finish on where we've headed since these two reports. Um, I wanted to share this with you because it is a horrible beginning, but a really great ending to that change is possible. So in um, Ireland on February, uh, 18 February 2011, the Irish Independent newspaper published an article, an opinion piece actually, that was titled, Sterilising Junkies May Seem Harsh, But It Does Make Sense. And um, a whole lot of drug user organisations, harm reduction organisations, needle and syringe programs, drug and alcohol programs, both in Ireland and internationally, made formal complaints to the Irish Press Ombudsman about this article. And on the 14th of June 2011, the Irish Press Ombudsman upheld a complaint by drug user organisations and others against the Irish Independent Newspaper, which in the article described drug users as vermin and feral, worthless scumbags, highlighting that language is not considered harmless or just words at law, and that individuals, including those employed in the media and health services, etc., will be held to account by the legal system if they participate in such behaviour at work. Um, so where I want to finish is with um, the project phase. So we did our market research and we made the report um, I've just gone through briefly. And from all of that information, we use that to uh, commission a uh, communications company. And we've now produced Able's first ever short film. Um, and it's our part of the project that is going to be targeting uh, the general public. In particular, we are looking to target uh, young people in post-secondary and tertiary education because we really believe they are 
the future of attitudes and they influence people both younger and older than them. But of course the film is available for, um, for, for general public viewing. It is available on its own website and I've got the website there. You can get access to these PowerPoints later. So I really do encourage you to look at it. It is targeting the general public. It's not targeting the drug and alcohol sector. And on the website you'll also see that um, there are uh, conversation starter type questions there. There's an evaluation there and there's also a little bit of background to making of the film. Uh, we launched that recently and it's been extremely well received by our target audience and others. We're also just uh, finalising the development um, of a new training module and this is, uh, I guess, for the part of the project targeting the healthcare, uh, in addition to healthcare uh, workers, we're looking to target students of relevant disciplines, so medicine, nursing, pharmacy and dentistry and that uh, is called Putting Together the Puzzle and it's a national training module on stigma and discrimination and injecting drug use and we'll be doing training of uh, tra training our trainers, uh, workshops very soon with the workers in drug use organisations and they will then be able to offer and deliver this across the country. And finally, um, I wanted to let you know about uh, this part of the project which is the part I suppose is targeting people who inject drugs. And it's an online resource and survey and it's called Discrimination Know Your Rights. That's just a snapshot on our website um, uh, of, the, of the opening page. It provides drug users with lots of information on what is stigma and discrimination, what is human rights, um, what is discrimination at law uh, as opposed to say perhaps poor treatment or uh, what often is called microaggressions, the sort of ongoing small slights and, and, and uh, difficulties drug users have every day of the week that can build up and lead to um, confrontations and, and lots of difficulties for people. So it explains all those sorts of things but importantly it has a survey in there, an online survey and we've not yet even advertised this really, we're about to start the promotion of it but in a matter of months we've had over 120 individual drug users um, do the survey online and um, we've already um, on the website, if you go to our website you'll find uh, a, a summary report that will show you a summary of the results so far. We'll be continuing to produce those reports but I suppose we're really encouraging drug users who are known not to come forward to use formal uh, complaints mechanisms. It's I suppose giving them a way to at least tell us anonymously what has happened to them. It's all de-identified and uh, but it is I think if you're at working in the health sector a very good way to understand how people who inject drugs themselves may be experiencing health services. So uh, that's it from me. I'll probably go and get over I think but um, I just my last slide is just to give you our contact details uh, so you'll get these um, PowerPoints and you can get us on Facebook and Twitter and our website and email and all that. Thank you. Great, thank you very much Annie. Thanks Annie for that presentation. Um, now we'll move on to Frank and Frank Quinlan is the CEO of the Mental Health Council of Australia which is the peak body for community mental health organisations. And Frank was previously the Executive Director of Catholic Social Services Australia, a peak national body um, for social services in Australia with 69 member organisations providing social and community services to over a million people each year. Uh, Frank has a long history of working in the not-for-profit sector, having previously worked at Grassmere Youth Services, Tranmere Street Youth Refuge and the Australian Drug Foundation, and having held senior positions at the Alcohol and Other Drug Council of Australia and the Australian Medical Association. Frank is a member of the Australian Government's Not-for-Profit Sector Reform Council. He completed his tertiary studies at both Monash and Melbourne Universities, and has been a guest policy um, programs at the Australian National University. Frank has published and contributed to a number of papers and has been quoted widely in the media on a range of social issues. Thank you, Frank. Thanks very much. Um, thanks very much, and I guess I should, uh, as well as thanking our, our host, the Community Mental Health Drug and Alcohol Research Network, uh, for the opportunity to speak. I should also thank you for the honorary doctorate that I see you gave me in the, um, some of the promotional materials. I was, I was delighted by that. My study didn't take me that far, uh, sadly, so I'm uh, not, not Dr Quinlan. 
uh, but very pleased to uh, to present some information about some of the work that the Mental Health Council of Australia have been doing in this uh, in this space. Uh, to begin, um, very briefly, just for those uh, who aren't aware, that the Mental Health Council of Australia is the national peak uh, body in the in the mental health space. So, in addition to the community mental health uh, organisations that have already been mentioned, uh, we really do have quite a diverse uh, membership of national organisations, uh, organisations representing consumers and carers, um, different clinical parts of clinical practice, and so on. So, we really are a sort of pretty broad uh, church in that sense and we're uh, quite uh, uh, proud of our engagement with the National Consumer, National Mental Health Consumer Care Forum and you'll hear me talk uh, about them a couple of times uh, during our presentation because they gave us uh, particular assistance in the, in the preparation of this report. Uh, I'm going to try and skip through a little bit so just so that we've got a little bit of time uh, left for questions at the end but I wanted to acknowledge up front uh, that um, this, this report actually preceded my time here at the Council, but the report was principally conducted by Rachel Irving, who was our um, Director of Research uh, at the time. Uh, it was done with funding from the Department of Health and Ageing, and it, uh, as I've already said, uh, worked closely with the National Mental Health Consumer and Carer Forum uh, to really fashion some of the questions and to test some of the ideas that were part of the uh, survey. And I'll come back to that a couple of times because I think uh, from a methodological perspective, uh, the opportunity to be really quite closely engaged with consumers and carers themselves in the development of the research uh, was probably one of the really important factors, I think, in, uh, in terms of a contribution uh, to its success. I also, before I got into my presentation uh, specifically, really wanted to uh, acknowledge and mention a couple of uh, consistencies with uh, the presentation that uh, I noticed uh, as uh, Annie spoke. Um, firstly, uh, as you'll hear me report, the, the project found that there were quite considerable differences uh, in various professional groups and in various ages and in various settings about the sorts of um, uh, stigma and perceptions of stigma uh, that people experienced. And that didn't necessarily re relate to one specific uh, profession or one specific location. Uh, but uh, I suspect there's something about the culture of different organisations in terms of the uh, perceptions of consumers and carers and their uh, experience. Uh, the other thing I noticed was uh, that, that um, Annie mentioned was the, this issue of reinforcement of self-stigma. I think that's an important issue and, uh, and I'm not going to try and uh, sort of answer it specifically today except to acknowledge that I think in the mental health space uh, as in the drug and alcohol space. There is much uh, stigma and perceptions that people have about themselves, people who are mental health consumers and their carers. And some of the things that we identify uh, through this research project uh, is partly about reinforcing that um, self-stigma as much as it is about applying uh, stigma um, in a sort of green fields uh, kind of way. The other thing that I'd observe is that um, uh, is the observation that uh, Annie made about uh, the physical health needs of people being ignored, and this is really just an aside, uh, because of the attention given to their, in our case, the mental health uh, needs, and in Annie's case, the uh, drug and alcohol needs. Uh, that's that's a, a perception that, uh, and a, a reality really in the mental health space that's been identified uh, over and over again, the particular challenge, I think, to uh, practice in this space. Um, we know in the mental health space, uh, for instance, that people with severe and persistent mental illness are likely to have life expectancies uh, more akin to Australia's indigenous population than uh, to the broader population. I think that tells you something about the extent to which their um, physical health needs are often and largely ignored uh, by the system or somehow get, get lost in the system uh, overall. So I wanted to begin with just what I would describe as, uh, as a sort of gross uh, summary of the research, if you like. Uh, firstly, to say that we, uh, we surveyed, and I'll talk a little bit about the sample, some 650 uh, consumers and carers and asked them to report their experience of uh, stigma when they encountered either the mental health system or the uh, broader system. And it's no surprise, I guess, as a headline to say that 
uh, in both uh, samples, so both amongst consumers and, and carers, there were significant experiences of uh, stigma. And that these varied uh, according to the usual sorts of factors, varied according to diagnoses, varied according to the uh, treatment setting, varied according to the, uh, the specific um, uh, professionals and uh, either mental health professionals or broader health professionals that were uh, part of the treating team uh, at the time. And perhaps, um, again, I think in, the, in clearest summary, uh, the levels of stigma were, that were reported were about similar to the levels of stigma that people experience when they encounter the broader population. So uh, I think for many that was a surprising finding, and in some ways it is a surprising finding. I think that those who are uh, closest to the service delivery um, areas of, of the system uh, had the same levels of uh, stigmatising attitudes or, or were perceived to have the same levels of stigmatising attitudes as others. Perhaps we expect more understanding broadly. Um, but I also think that it's, uh, it's also true that uh, you know, we have to recognise that the people who are delivering services in this space are in fact the, um, are in fact the uh, same people who make up the community. So mental health professionals and broader health professionals are the same sorts of, uh, uh, of people and will have a, a, a pretty typical profile as the rest of the community. So in that sense, these findings ought to be no great uh, surprise to us. Uh, briefly, this, this presentation that I'll give you now will just uh, broadly outline uh, the uh, stages of the research uh, and, and we'll give some feedback on the particular aspects of the uh, of the, of the research or the particular findings of the research, but given that this is a, uh, a research group, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on on some of the um, on some of the um, methodological aspects of the research. So, in, in short, I'll talk about uh, briefly about the literature review, about the survey methodology, the results that we found, and then and then perhaps hint at, at some discussion. We began with a literature review, as much uh, much research does. And it's fair to say, I think, that broadly, uh, th this was uh, the literature review suggests that our findings were broadly consistent with the international literature. Not a, um, uh, not a significantly well uh, described area of research, though there are pockets of research. Um, and the particular focus on consumer and carer experiences was also something unique. Uh, but just to say that the international literature suggested that that finding that uh, there are uh, there are going to be pockets of, uh, of stigmatising attitudes that are going to be broadly represented the broader population uh, is not uh, that uncommon a finding. Uh, a finding. The international literature and the, the pages that you have on those slides are pages that are taken from the uh, the report itself. The international literature also uh, points to the uh, sometimes devastating effect of those stigmatising attitudes. Uh, because I think one of the dangers is that we can uh, minimise what we, what we think are the uh, effects of stigmatising attitudes. And I think part of what uh, these sorts of research projects, one that Annie's identified in this project to do, is highlight the need for us to take those stigmatising attitudes seriously because of the impact that they have, uh, not just as we, know, as we now know on the mental health outcomes, but on the broader health outcomes uh, for both consumers and carers. It was also reported in, this, uh, in the international literature that there was no uh, clear understanding of why these attitudes would persist amongst uh, mental health and broader health professionals, and no particular understanding of why they would be different in, uh, in uh, particular settings. And uh, I think that's one of the areas where uh, possibly there's an opportunity for us to uh, identify future work. Uh, in addition, uh, I think that there's uh, an opportunity for us uh, in terms of um, uh, perhaps linking together some of these issues around per perception and stigma and linking them to the opportunity to conduct uh, research into how programs to destigmatize and to reduce stigma uh, can be effective. But to go on and talk about the uh, survey uh, methodology uh, just uh, briefly, I've already acknowledged the important uh, work uh, of the National Mental Health Consumer and Carer Forum in their engagement uh, with this project. 
There were some uh, 24 members of that um, Consumer Care Forum who were involved in the preparation of the uh, material. But I think more importantly, perhaps, or it's, it's my, as importantly, perhaps, as the development of the materials, was the engagement of that uh, network in the process, uh, I think also has uh, an effect on yielding uh, survey respondents. So the survey uh, respondents in our case were a self-selected sample, a convenient uh, uh, sample. So I think the work that um, researchers can do in engaging with groups like the uh, Consumer Care Forum and, and others uh, from the design stages of the, uh, of the project are likely to be very effective in terms of uh, attracting uh, respondents and attracting uh, people to that survey. Uh, it goes without saying that the uh, two survey instruments had to be quite different for uh, consumers and uh, carers. Uh, although they were based on uh, similar sorts of survey formats, uh, the, the um, customisation of uh, the instruments, I think, was also uh, very important in terms of both attracting respondents and ensuring that uh, the, the responses were, were appropriate. Is that, it's, our survey was quite a long uh, survey. I don't know off the top of my head remember the number of questions, but quite a long survey. And so I think the um, the effort that is taken in terms of the engagement uh, with people directly about clarifying those uh, survey questions and uh, is very important in terms of ensuring that people are, are then able to complete the survey. As I said uh, earlier, it was a convenient sample uh, and we had some uh, 427 uh, uh, consumers who uh, completed the survey and some 250 almost uh, carers who completed the survey. So although it had some limitations in terms of its, uh, its sampling, it was quite a significant sample size and I think that gives us uh, an opportunity to draw uh, some strength from the, uh, from the findings. It is of course only a, a snapshot and as I'll say later on, I think some longitudinal work that would allow us to compare the changes in attitudes uh, over time uh, would be a valuable additional contribution as would uh, uh, work that was uh, designed to ensure that the programs that we might implement to reduce uh, stigma and to reduce stigmatising practices, uh, we, could, uh, we could use these kinds of surveys uh, to uh, address their effectiveness. Uh, I, I also think in terms of uh, the, the methodology of the survey, it's important to, to acknowledge that there were also, uh, in addition to the uh, quantitative uh, measures, there was uh, an opportunity to collect qualitative uh, information, and in terms of the final report, once it was uh, once it was produced, this is the report I have in my hands now. I think the opportunity to include that um, qualitative information to illustrate the um, uh, to illustrate the outcomes uh, from a quantitative perspective were important. Now, I'll just very quickly take a, a, one of the quotes that will give you a sense of that sort of uh, uh, colour. Uh, I would like to say, and this is a, a quote from uh, one of the consumers, I would like to say that I, gave, I, I came across some very nice, genuinely caring professionals in my 11 years as a mental health consumer. My current psychiatrist, psychologist and GP are excellent and I feel that the care they provide is very good. I've had more negative experiences in public hospitals than in private practice. I understand that public psych wards can be very unrewarding places but I sometimes feel that staff can get a little too disillusioned. The poor communication between the public system and my private doctor can lead to more stigmatising assumptions when my descriptions differ from the official record. I'm assumed to be lying. To be honest, the psych registrars, registrars in the public wards are often more understanding and polite than nursing staff. Most of my negative experiences have been at the hands of nursing staff. I'm not sure whether more comprehensive education of nursing staff would be enough to shift the attitude, the, uh, the attitude problem that I encountered. So you see, even in one quote like that, and there are there are many uh, littered throughout the research. Um, there are some really uh, very insightful observations of the system, and I think some very strong clues about where we could go next, uh, where we could go next with some of those um, uh, research results. 
Uh, so I understand we're uh, we're pretty pressed for time, and I'm going to uh, to try and skip through uh, quite quickly. Uh, in short, uh, consumers them, themselves. Uh, had a pretty negative experience, uh, or a negative experience of, of stigma was quite common. And you see there that uh, some 31% of consumers were encouraged to reduce their expectations in life, which I think is a, a particularly tragic finding. We also found that um, uh, people experienced a change of attitudes. So the uh, experience of a change of behaviour is quite common. So once their uh, health professional realised they had a uh, mental illness, uh, their attitude um, uh, changed and they weren't uh, as comfortable talking to them. Uh, the majority of people also uh, found that talking about their um, lived experience of, me of mental illness created an unfavourable perception. And I think, again, this goes to some of the questions that we have about uh, self-stigmatising uh, attitudes. From the perspective of carers, we see that almost uh, half experienced that the care was uh, less than competent uh, because of the um, because of the identification of a mental illness. Uh, we also found that a quarter of carers, uh, while a quarter of carers felt that they were an equal member of the team, some 60% indicated that they were not. So this is this business of uh, carers who will have an intimate knowledge and uh, often historic knowledge of the uh, presenting problem, often not uh, feeling as if they were. Um, uh, well engaged as, as part of the team. Um, we also found that uh, uh, carers did not feel that they were, often did not feel that they were listened to uh, by providers. In terms of the sort of broad conclusions that we that we draw from that, and I, um, I, I hope that we, we leave some opportunities for questions and so on here, uh, although time's getting away, uh, was that there, it, it's clear that the um, uh, many issues occurred in a hospital setting and, and we're not trying to bash hospitals and you'll see that uh, if you read the full report there were different experiences in different uh, hospitals but uh, a lot of them were in a hospital setting and may well have to do with the uh, busy uh, pressures that those environments create as much as the physical settings, a lot to be explored there. Uh, we also found though that there were uh, mixed experiences amongst professional groups and between professional groups and, and across settings and I think that tells us uh, something about uh, the organisational uh, uh, culture of particular organisations being important in terms of it, it, its effects. And I think that leads us then to a question about what it is that we might be able to say about uh, the training of uh, health professionals and the environment that health professionals are working in. Uh, some of our targets for intervention might be those health professionals themselves because we may need to reduce some of their stigmatising attitudes. But part of it might also be about uh, addressing their environment more broadly so that they actually have the resources available to them to do the kind of work that they probably uh, wish they could do. I've given some acknowledgement to, to Rachel in the forum but also to some of the key um, uh, working group members who provided uh, input to us in that space. So I'm sorry to gallop through the findings there. As I said, it's not my research so I'm really only in a position uh, to point you to it. I'd encourage you to uh, have a look at the research uh, in detail because there's, there's quite a, uh, a rich picture there of the sorts of uh, experiences that consumers and carers had. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. I'm not sure if it's back to me, Kath, now. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Kath. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much to both of you for those presentations. So we move on to the discussion part now, which um, we've got uh, seven minutes for, but I think we do have the capacity to go a bit further if, if there is interest in, in maintaining an ongoing discussion. We got a few questions pop up, and please feel free, um, others, to send through your questions if you have some. Uh, but just the first one from um, one of the participants was, if you could both explain, perhaps first starting with you, Annie, a bit about the ethics processes that you had to go through uh, in order to do your research. Yeah. Okay. So um, probably to be clear that um, in the case of the second report, 
it's not, uh, it wasn't research, it was, uh, you know, a, a report, I guess, we researched um, historical facts and uh, social theory and, you know, it's more of an analysis, I guess, so that's not uh, looking at researching participants. The market research was, as I said, done by an independent uh, market research company that went through standard ethics um, approval processes that they're required to undertake. Um, and ABLE didn't, you know, undertake the market research itself. Uh, but in terms of our online survey, um, as a non-government organisation, ABLE obviously isn't required uh, to undertake um, formal ethics uh, clearance for, for a survey like that. But uh, we take those issues really seriously and we do actually have our own set. And so, as far as I know, they are the only of their only sort of type of their kind in the world, a set of... Uh, ethical guideline, research guidelines for people doing research with uh, drug users, illicit drug users and injecting drug users, which we've had for some time. And we always ensure that the work we do uh, follows those guidelines and they meet all the standard types of ethical uh, inquiry. We also um, talked with a number of key senior academics in research around the country about uh, ethical requirements and just ensuring getting review of our survey and all of that to ensure that the benefits are, you know, outweighing any potential negative, you know, risks or possibilities um, and ensuring that we were asking things appropriately, protecting people's confidentiality. So all of those uh, ethical kind of clearance factors have been ticked off, but as an NGO, we're not required to do that formally. There's no clear body for us to go to. Um, and from our perspective, we worked through uh, Deakin University, their uh, Human Ethics uh, Research Integrity Division, I think, I think it's called. And for those with an interest in, in the uh, first appendix of the uh, published report, we do give the details there of that, uh, a little bit about that, about that application process, including some uh, contact information. So we essentially used a third party through Deakin University to achieve um, uh, ethics approval, which I think, uh, I, I stand to be correct, but I think was important to our uh, funder in particular. Yeah, definitely. And um, I find it's always interesting that the ethics process, like as um, Annie, you were describing it, it's quite involved and quite detailed, um, the process you have to go through before you even get any of these studies underway. But in the actual reports and things like that, it only ever, you know, comes to normally one line or something. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we've got uh, another question, which is uh, whether or not either of you have uh, already or plan to submit these studies uh, for peer review for publication in academic journals. Um, I'm happy to start here if you, if you like. I mean, we, we have not. Um, it's uh, the work, work of the Mental Health uh, Council of Australia uh, is broadly um, targets our involvement in the sort of public policy discourse, if you like. So our research is principally aimed at um, influencing the public debate and the public discourse. We would hope that uh, a research project like this, as we've already indicated, would have spin-off research that might well be conducted uh, directly in, uh, in academic institutions and so forth, but that's not our pri primary uh, purpose for conducting the research. And I, and I think, you know, I, I can see uh, the argument both ways in terms of how some of that research is, is conducted and I think it warrants a bit of reflection right up front about uh, what it is that uh, you're trying to achieve in, in, uh, in finalising a piece of research. Um, just really quickly, I would totally agree with what Frank said, the same sort of thing for us. It wasn't the primary sort of objective for us uh, that, you know, obviously what we were trying to do was to develop a body of work that could inform our project work in the space to ensure that project work was, was properly informed by, um, you know, investigation. So that was our aim, but, um, no, we're not considering that. And I guess there's also... Um you know, as you mentioned, it's not your aim. I mean, there's also a number of pros and cons. Mm. Go for um, a peer review um, article, which um, particularly I'm thinking um, both of your reports are quite extensive and comprehensive, and there's no way that you could pack all of that information into, um, for example, a journal article that would be restricted to between three or 5,000 words. Yeah, yeah, I think you just need to pick a single topic or, get, you know, 
sort of theme within it or something like that, yeah. And one of the other ones we have is uh, what advice would you give to uh, NGOs or peak bodies who, um, uh, in terms of how to reduce stigma in those settings? Ah, well, um, I, you know, at the risk of sounding a little sort of self-interested here, you know, obviously that's uh, part of our aim with our new training module is to encourage, uh, as we once we finish training the trainers um, and do some promotional materials, we really hope that both through ABLE at the national level and then our state and territory bodies at, at the local level to um, encourage organisations and services in the health sector and, and universities universities uh, for health student related students uh, to take up that training to start I suppose providing opportunities for these issues to just even have a conversation just to open the door to discuss some of the issues we do recognize and through the development of our training module one issue I'll quickly mention is that we do actually really re sort of recognize that these can be quite confronting issues for people and particularly our professionals because you know people work hard to get to where they are and get their qualifications and and people often are aiming to do the right thing there's all sorts of contextual issues that can impact on that and um, as Frank has mentioned also kind of cultural issues within workplaces and whatever so you know I, I think it is important to not yeah to take these things um, fairly methodically look at training and um, considered programs that provide an opportunity to reflect and identify issues without people feeling um, confronted um, or by it because as our market research showed on these particular issues well for drug users anyway if people do feel like it's too confrontational the response is likely to be a negative one um, yeah I think as everyone will recognize that these are really complex issues and so they're going to require a complex response. I think uh, importantly one of the things we need to do is uh, in the mental health space is reduce uh, uh, stigmatising attitudes in the broad community and I think that will flow into the, uh, into the health environment just as it will flow into other environments but that's easier said than done of course. Uh, I, I think there is a rich opportunity for um, the training environments that uh, health professionals and mental health professionals are working in. Part of that is about identifying that stigma does actually uh, exist, stigma and discrimination exist, and that people need to be aware of that, and some of that awareness in itself will lead to change, and I think that's uh, important to ensure that as part of uh, health curriculum and mental health curriculum that people uh, understand that uh, stigma and discrimination actually have clinical outcomes for their, uh, the people that they're uh, wishing to serve and so they need to be addressed to achieve those clinical outcomes. Uh, I'd say additionally we need to be careful as with all stigma programs really and this could be the subject of another seminar we need to disaggregate so whilst stigma occurs uh, broadly I think the reasons for its occurrence are often different in different settings and different environments. So I think disaggregating the uh, target groups for those sorts of uh, programs is important. And then lastly, uh, I think we also need to look honestly at uh, the sorts of environments that we're asking people to work in and, uh, and to better understand what sorts of contribution the particular environment uh, can make to work cultures and so on. If people are flat stick and dead busy and worked off their feet then um, you know we can naturally expect that uh, practices in a whole range of fronts won't be up, quite up to the same standards that we'd hoped for. Uh, and that's not about training those people, that's about making sure that the environment that they're working in is adequate and well supported and that they can do the work that they no doubt aspire to just like anybody else aspires to. I think one of the things that I noticed um, as well as you were talking, you know, we, we're seeing the increasing um, research and attention being paid to the issue of stigma in mental health and in drug and alcohol. Um, but hearing, um, Annie, from your talk about uh, looking at the historical review, mm -hmm. you don't often hear or see historical reviews in this field. Yeah. And it really kind of has highlighted how very well entrenched um, you know, going back such a long way. So, in terms of trying to fix this, 
Mm -hmm. Sounds like it's going to be something that, like many things, can't happen overnight, but it really does need a, a sustained and big effort. Absolutely, and it's precisely why, well, you know, for our part, which is we're a small organisation, that we really felt like, you know, if we don't take this on as people who inject drugs or people with a history of injecting drug use, if we don't take it on, no one is going to, really. And um, so we had a very important, we felt we had a very important role to play, in, but it is why we decided to take our kind of comprehensive project based approach and have different parts of the project that all link together and can be used together in different ways but are targeting different parts of the issue and different target groups. Um, but you're absolutely right. That is one of the key reasons why we decided to develop the second report was that the market research showed us we were just sort of scratching the tip of the iceberg and that we realised, as you just said, there really wasn't anything out there um, that is like a historical review of how the hell have we got to this place kind of thing. And and we just, I mean, and there were so many factors, there are so many factors, it's very complex. And we could have taken any range of factors. We tried to pick what we thought were some of the very key ones. But what we did find, as you've mentioned, is that it's, we're talking hundreds of years of attitudes that have been slowly built, both deliberately and non-deliberately over time. And uh, it is really entrenched and it is gonna take a very sustained, pragmatic, um, you know, ongoing approach through through many organisations and mechanisms. I also think, if you don't mind me jumping in there, Annie, I also think um, that we in, if I can broadly describe we, as we in the sort of human spaces, human services space, mm -hmm. tend to uh, have a bit of a, a gently, gently educational approach to some of these things, and I think that's fine and, and appropriate. Um, I, I think we need to also uh, be aware of this, the sorts of opportunities that sometimes quite confrontational uh, approaches uh, can break through uh, existing systems. So using uh, human rights and equal opportunities commissions and so on to identify really gross examples of discrimination and to identify examples of systemic uh, discrimination can provide us to really um, sort of break through from time to time. I think other things have to be right. Mm. I think taking those sort of uh, case studies to those sorts of uh, commissions mean then that you, you know the various systems around the place actually have to change their mm. practice in order to avoid the future risk of, of legal action and so on. Yes, yeah. and I think it's really important that those bodies do that because there'll be some roles that while I'm saying I think Abel has a very important role to play in this as, as consumers and users, there's some things that our own market research has told us that if we try and do that, we'll likely get a more negative response. So there'll be certain things that are, are good for us to do and that, you know, there's just jobs for so many different types of organisations in That's this exactly right. space, yeah. Uh, as usual, I guess, research breeds future research. <laughs> and, um, on that, uh, if you look down in one of the message boards, you'll see, um, Frank, as you were talking about future research, and someone's written in about a proposal that they've put in, um, which will also further the research in the area. Um, again, if anyone wants to write in with questions, feel, please feel free. But while there aren't any, I can ask some of my own, which is good. Um, so I was just wondering, like, we'll, we'll probably only go for another seven minutes um, because we have the time, but I was wondering if each of you, um, perhaps starting with Frank, could tell us a bit about what led you to choose the methodologies that you used in your projects, um, specifically I guess in relation to how you thought they would best answer your research question or you know, whether there were other constraints that um, led you to use that particular method? Yeah, sure, and I'm sorry to say here that the, that the, as I said, the research predated my time here, so I'm not the best uh, person to answer that question directly, but perhaps if I can answer it uh, indirectly, uh, our bias in, in the sorts of work that uh, we do is unashamedly to, to sort of try and give as much voice as possible to that sense of direct consumer and carer experience uh, where we can. Uh, so broadly, we'll um, try and identify a gap, and this was a clear uh, gap in the um, in the research. 
uh, and really try and inject into that or find ways of injecting into that uh, the direct voices of consumers and carers. So I guess in that sense, um, a mixture of uh, quantitative data and, uh, and qualitative work in our sort of space, in that, as, as I described earlier, in that public advocacy uh, space, is is really important. We weren't, in that sense, trying to solve a particular issue for the organisation. We weren't responding to a uh, particular uh, challenge. We were we were purposefully uh, trying to to conduct some research that would uh, have a maximum impact in the public space. And on many fronts, my own experience is that. Uh, the opportunity to combine that sort of qualitative and quantitative information uh, can be really important in terms of influencing that public agenda and that public policy agenda. You sort of need the numbers to back up your anecdotes, uh, but you need the anecdotes as well, I think, to give colour and life to uh, the numbers. And broadly, I think uh, many people responsible in the public policy space have a much better memory for uh, anecdotes than they do for uh, numbers. Yeah, and that's, um, you know, definitely what you see in, in a lot of the research is, you know, combining those quantitative and qualitative uh, methods in, in a mixed methods or triangulation approach to try and really give life to and meaning more depth to the to the numbers. And as I already gave with, with just the, the one quote that I gave, you know, there's also, in, as I said, even in that one quote, which is, you know, less than a, a hundred words, you know, there are three or four really key ideas, I think, about future research and future interventions in this space. So uh, sometimes the numbers don't lead you to the solutions. They, they identify problems. I think it's much more likely the uh, qualitative work that starts to lead you towards uh, some of the potential solutions and next steps. And Annie, yours was um, a completely different method of... Yeah. Mm, um, so, yeah, in the sense that, you know, we, as I said, we had a market research company do that for us, but our purpose, I suppose, was very much a very practical one that was about informing a future campaign and project work. Um, it's not an area of expertise we felt we had, but for the reasons I outlined, um, the method of sort of you know, getting a comp an independent agency to do the work for us was an important decision, you know, in itself so that we would get some honest reflections, and we certainly got that, um, but also uh, so that we would, um, you know, really be able to sort of um, trust the, the results and others um, outside of ABLE looking at this would, would see it as a, you know, credible research basis for what we were doing. And look, it was enormously helpful in terms of us identifying the research gaps that we had to look at in terms of the other report we put together. Uh, but also, you know, it gave us really the guidance, particularly in terms of developing the film, but also the training module and, and our online survey as well. But particularly the film, I mean, it was really the market research was very central for the communications agency that we got to do the, the short film. Um, it really helped us figure out just how baby, how small the step was that we needed to try and make with our film um, in targeting the general public, that just how careful we needed to be, some of the issues that we needed to be aware of, the attitudes and perceptions, how, how strongly the stereotypes, the traditional stereotypes are held, where they come from, what might be driving them and how we might be able to start, you know, un unpacking that a little bit. So um, our purpose was very a very practical one, and um, the methodology, the focus groups with the general public and the health sector were very much driven both by that practical outcome and by the fact that there was existing evidence showing um, that while we want, knew we wanted to target the general public, so we knew we needed to be talking to the general public in our research, um, the health sector was just is so clearly. Um, you know, identified in the available evidence on both hepatitis B-related discrimination and stigma and discrimination in relation to injecting drug use, that we knew we had to include that them in the uh, in the market research because not to do that would have um, had this very central group missing from our understanding of of what needs to change. So, uh, yeah, you know, that kind of drove, I suppose, some of our methodological kind of. Uh, question. I guess just one other final thing that was interesting that I mentioned in my presentation was just the advice that we got and took 
from the market research company about you know not attempting to just recruit sort of quite you know blindly or whatever from the general public that they felt we needed to kind of target people who may have slightly more progressive views already towards drug use and and the attitudes we got back were really full on and really negative so I'd hate to see what might have come out of it if we actually had sort of gone with people who saw themselves as sort of rapidly anti-drugs or something so you know it's there's a long way to go yeah Absolutely. um I, I find it really interesting that um that both of you used the different methods you know so Frank talking about a study that was primarily quantitative with a, a little bit of qualitative in it, um, but yours, which was very much a qualitative focus. And I guess the advantage of um, the quantitative focus is that it allows you to uh, get more of an idea of the, the spread of a problem and, and, and how, um, how common it is. But the qualitative gives you that opportunity to really explore that issue a lot more in depth than you can ever do by looking at a number. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess one of the important things, and I think which is a, a, a strength, is to look at the fact that they were both very different studies, mm -hmm. yet both came to very similar conclusions and similar findings, um, showing the consistency there. Yeah, that's true. Um, so it's not, there's not ever one way of doing things, but multiple ways of doing things. Um, we're at quarter past five, so unfortunately we will have to wrap up. I'd just like to thank both of our presenters uh, today for presenting on a very, very interesting presentations and very important topic. Um, and both of the studies have uh, been to the field, often uh, unfortunately under-researched. Um, and I guess from my perspective in particular, uh, as someone who does research predominantly on what are effective treatments, it seems just like one of those fundamental core issues of, well, it's all good and well for us to look at what are, what are the good treatments, but if something as fundamental as uh, the stigma is still there affecting whether or not people can access those services and uh, then what kind of service they're going to get when they get there, it um, kind, of, kind of brings in the question that, you know, that really needs to be addressed as something that's fundamental before all, all these other things can fall into place. So thank you both very much, and I'd also just like to um, thank Deb Tipper uh, for coordinating this. Um, she's done a wonderful job in organising it. And um, also thank all of our participants for coming today, and hopefully you will come along to our next one, which Deb will send you information about. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.